Um, so yeah, I, uh, I just wanted to kind of, uh, echo some, some giants that I had to follow there. Um, I really appreciate uh, all the EMS providers uh, taking the time to come on and listen to us today. I know it's, uh, it's really tough over WebEx and I'd love to do this live and hopefully the next one we get to do is live. So I appreciate taking the time to virtually join us and I uh, really appreciate your care. Um, my plug for Dublin is that their pistachio muffins are fantastic. So I'll, I'll, I'll give them credit for that. Um, so I've been tasked um, to talk about TXA for the EMS provider. And I know that this uh, this topic is is important and uh, at times maybe a little dense. So I, I appreciate your time and hopefully you've got a cup of coffee so we can make this through together. But I thought we could sort of cover the basics, um, sort of cover the nuts and bolts, talk about uh, a little bit maybe uh, why we would and would not use TXA, um, particularly in the pre-hospital realm, and then maybe kind of uh, sort of do a big picture view of TXA. So let's get the blood flowing. Um, I, I like to start off with a case just so we can get uh, maybe a framework of what, what we might use TXA for. So this is the juicy stuff. So, you know, we've got this 23 year old male, you were called to a scene, crashes his motorcycle. He's going 120 miles per hour, not wearing a helmet, throwing 100 feet from the motorcycle. His blood pressure is 60 over palp. His heart rates in the 130s and you mush on his pelvis. It seems very unstable. He has no breath sounds on the left. He's got severe facial injury and bleeding from his nose. And his GCS is five. His left leg is, is cracked in half and he's got pulsatile bleeding. And in the whole mess of this, you're thinking, boy, what can I do to help this patient? And could TXA maybe be a part of his care? So here are the four things that we go through. So maybe a little bit about what TXA is, um, some uses of it. And the third part's really probably the, the one I was hoping to focus on the most is the evidence behind it and some of the literature behind TXA. And then we'll close with the big picture. So TXA, what is it? Tranexamic acid. Uh, nothing's easy in medicine and just be careful. It's sort of a personal experience that there are a lot of initials. There's TXA, there's TNK, there's TPA. And unfortunately I've been involved with some care where the wrong medicine was given. So always know what medication you're giving and TXA tranexamic acid uh, is one that uh, is very different than say TPA, very, very different indication. So it's basically, um, it's an oldie but goodie. Um, it's a competitive inhibitor of plasminogen activation to plasmin. What the heck is that? I have no idea what that is. If any biochemistry majors are out there, please let me know. Uh, all I know is, uh, really is that it prevents clots from being broken down. You may hear the term anti-fibrinolytic. So fibrinolysis means to destroy clots and it's an anti-clot destroyer. So kind of important. So our body's natural ability um, is sort of a homeostate and homeostasis is to form clots and dissolve clots and form clots and dissolve clots naturally and, and trauma or some, or some other type of, uh, of bleeding condition. We want clots to stick around and, and treat and TXA is a, is a medication that yeah, prevents that clot from being broken down. Sort of an important um, kind of uh, take is that it does not form clots, which uh, will help us a little later to know how it might be actually safe in a lot of conditions. It's not really a, a clot former. Uh, it doesn't make clots. It prevents clots from being broken down and that's kind of important. So I, I know it's a virtual and I won't get any uh, uh, responses, but maybe you can you can talk this out loud with your cat or your fish. I, I have Mr. Bubbles in my background. So I guess, what do you think are the two labeled indications for TXA? You can say it out loud if you want or just say it in your head. Um, so FDA approved indications for TXA. You may be surprised. Trauma is not one of them. It's actually menstrual, heavy menstrual bleeding and tooth extraction in patients with hemostatic defects like hemophilia. So um, kind of interesting that's, that, that we use a lot of uh, the, the times we use TXA is actually off label. Um, and you might hear about about 4,000 things that we use it off label, not necessarily FDA approved, but things that uh, we might use it for uh, both pre-hospital and in the emergency department. Um, TXA, very popular, you know, ketamine is popular in the, in the ED, TXA is popular in national blogs in, in the emergency department and pre-hospital realm. And this is kind of the, the hot topic of the last year or two. So you might see it for dental extraction patients that are bleeding on anticoagulants, patients with hemoptysis, angioedema, uh, epistaxis, intracerebral hemorrhage, cardiac surgery, 
perioperative prevention of blood loss, postpartum hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage, gastrointestinal bleeding. Um, the two we'll focus on probably the most are trauma-associated hemorrhage and traumatic brain injury. Um, but we'll cover um, most of these and talk a little bit about the, the background and the literature. So I gotta give credit where credit is due. Um, there is a podcast uh, called MRAP, an ED podcast, and um, they covered a little bit of this. Um, this is maybe two years ago before many of these, actually the trials we'll cover were fully published, but they kind of went through this red light, yellow light, green light kind of uh, algorithm. And I kind of like it, so we're gonna go that direction. So red light, stop, definitely don't use TXA. Yellow, maybe proceed with, with caution. Um, maybe um, uh, future uh, studies and, and development of research is needed. And green light is the go. That's uh, go ahead and get used TXA and, and don't feel guilty about it. All right, so when we start with the, the probably the most important one I think we're all thinking of and the one that's most relevant maybe to pre-hospital providers is trauma. So really three major studies I was hoping to talk about. So um, CRASH-2 matters and STAMP. These are probably your hallmark studies if you're uh, into research and wanna know a little bit about the evidence behind TXA. CRASH-2 was probably the one that really got the juices started. Um, huge study, almost 20,000 trauma patients. It's an RCT, randomized controlled trial, 274 hospitals in 40 different countries. And they looked at giving TXA versus placebo in trauma patients, mostly blunt trauma patients, that were randomized within eight hours of their injury. And they looked at all cause mortality within four weeks. And they tried to include uh, patients that had uh, low blood pressure, systolic blood pressure less than 90, heart rate over 110, adults. And uh, they tried to give uh, TXA within eight hours. And it actually did show a mortality benefit, 1.5% all cause mortality benefit, which doesn't seem huge, but when you're talking about 20,000 patients or in the US, hundreds of thousands of patients with blood blunt injury, a year, that's quite a bit of mortality benefit. So um, definitely showed benefit from a, from a blunt trauma standpoint. They're, they showed no difference in the number of blood products they needed. And they um, really found that patients that had a TXA given to them within three hours of their injury did well. Those that were above three hours didn't seem to have any benefit. And interestingly enough, those that were really sick, blood pressure less than 75, shocky patients that you look at, pre-hospital think, boy, this person, this person is going to uh, expire from this injury. Those patients did the best and probably got the most uh, mortality benefit. Uh, the important thing to VTE, that stands for venous thromboembolism. So things like blood clots uh, in your legs that might uh, progress into the lungs, pulmonary embolism. Um, there are no increased risk uh, in this cohort. So uh, honestly, this gets a green light. It was, uh, it seemed to be safe and it showed to show, seemed to show mortality benefit in those that uh, were severely injured less than three hours, particularly less than one hour. So then we kind of go over to the military a little bit. There's the, the MATTERS trial. This is a, a single center study. It's a military study. I think it's did uh, for military application of tranic septic acid and trauma emergency resuscitation. And uh, this is actually a military Afghanistan uh, a study. It looked at TXA versus new, no TXA in trauma patients that received blood. And again, mostly penetrating injuries. Crash 2 is mostly blunt injuries. This is mostly penetrating injury, more military-based cohort. And this looked at mortality at one day, two days, 30 days, um, about 900 patients or so. Um, it showed a, an improvement in mortality uh, at about two days and 30 days, not in one day, interestingly enough, um, but it did show more pronounced benefit in those receiving mass transfusion. Um, it, uh, it did not show um, any uh, fatalities from thromboembolic events, but it did show a little bit increased um, uh, amount of, uh, vondo, uh, of VTE, of uh, embolic phenomenon, but, but very small. We're, we're talking a very uh, few percentage of these patients had VTE. So I would, uh, I would give this kind of a light green. It, it did seem to be um, mostly unharmful and sure to have some benefit. Um, and I'd say not quite as green as CRASH-2, but it seems to have some benefit and penetrating trauma as well. The key here is again, very sick patients, those that really needed massive transfusion and had signs of uh, significant shock and increased severity of their trauma scores did the best. And then we'll move on to STAMP. This is maybe the most recent one you might hear about. Um, this is a, a multi-centered randomized control trial as well. It looked at uh, TXA versus placebo. 
Um, and this actually included those that had um, injury within two hours, uh, uh, they got TXA within two hours of their injury. And again, one episode of hypotension, blood pressure less than 90 or heart rate one over, over 110. Also about 900 patients, also mostly blunt injury. Unfortunately, it was a little bit underpowered. They're hoping to get more patients in their trial, but just unfortunately did not get the, the number that they're hoping for. Um, they had kind of a moderately uh, sick cohort as well. They're, if you have, are interested in ISS scores, their ISS score was 12, which is moderately to high trauma uh, severity score. Uh, this did not show any difference in mortality, interestingly enough, uh, or need for transfusion uh, or need or, uh, or signs of uh, prevention of multi-organ system failure. Um, there was uh, no increased risk in thromboembolic events either. Um, the one thing they did is they did some subgroup analysis. So they took some of their data and they say, who, who might show some benefit? And they actually saw maybe a 30 day mortality benefit in those that received TXA within one hour and those with severe shock. So maybe you're kind of hearing this theme, give it early if you're gonna give it and give it to those that are really ill. Uh, interestingly enough, this trial looked at uh, those that received TXA pre-hospital and may receive a bolus, uh, a repeat bolus in the hospital. And uh, those that actually received a TXA pre-hospital and then received their extra bolus in the ED did better too. So yeah, it's kind of a, a yellow for me. Um, not a whole lot of data that their endpoint, or primary endpoint showed mortality benefit. But if you look at those in their trial that were really sick, and if those that were given TXA really early, those people did seem to show a benefit. So I'd say maybe uh, proceed with caution. Um, the next uh, kind of uh, part of trauma is those that just have head injuries. Now, this is sort of a, um, a kind of evolving literature and evolving database as well. We're uh, not quite there in the hospital, but we might, uh, you might see kind of the literature and some of the research behind just uh, traumatic brain injury. So uh, three trials, uh, there's CRASH-3, uh, randomized control trial, about 175 hospitals, uh, 29 countries, adult patients with TBI, also getting TXA within three hours of injuries, TXA versus placebo. And they, they try to um, uh, really kind of exclude those that were having alternate causes of injury. This is trying to be isolated head injury, head injury if possible. And they looked at uh, GCS 12 or less, or if they found uh, hemorrhage on CT scan with no extracranial bleeding. So this, there's no significant difference uh, in head injury related deaths. Um, the one thing is, again, they kind of took their data and they, they excluded uh, those that may be really ill and gonna you know, pass away regardless and try to exclude those that were gonna do well no matter what and try to get that middle ground and see what happens there. And maybe a sliver of benefit with those mild to moderate TBI patients within three hours of injury. Um, important to note is that they did not show any increased risk of embolic events. So it seems that the mounting evidence here is that there's no harm uh, for this, probably another yellow for me. Um, maybe a little bit more, little hint of green, but uh, for the most part, I think we need more evidence to, to really give it in the isolated trauma patient, the isolated head injured uh, trauma patient. So then the next one uh, we'll talk about the meta-analysis of TXA for TBI. So for those that know, uh, meta-analysis is basically a collection of smaller studies to try to make a larger benefit or a larger statement about uh, uh, small studies. And keep in mind with meta-analysis, if you have a, a bunch of not so good smaller studies and you mince them together and make a, a big trial, it's gonna be the old term garbage in, garbage out. So if you don't have great studies in, you're not gonna have great data out and the vice versa. So this uh, showed maybe improvement of your hematoma, how much blood is on a CAT scan, but no mortality benefit and no real um, change in your thromboembolic uh, phenomena either. Uh, did not show any difference in mortality nor in neurologic functional status either. So I think this is a, a yellow right now. I don't think we have enough to really say that this is, should be given carte blanche for uh, isolated traumatic brain injury. A little bit more research I think has to be done. And then TikTok is a pediatric trial underway and uh, I think uh, um, that might be coming out in the next year or two. I don't have any information on that, but uh, is, uh, is underway. So trauma bottom line, I guess I'm gonna give it a, a, a green, light green, um, mostly green. I, I, think it's, um, I think it's a good medication. And I think the data really shows that we're not gonna give patients really clots. I, I think it's um, fairly safe to say that um, uh, clinically based evidence that you're not really going to form clots. There was a little concern 
I believe, um, you know, for increased venous thromboembolism, but the, the clinical data doesn't really show that. Um, and it does seem to benefit those that are severely injured. Um, really want to be just kind of talk it over with your department as to their um, and medical director as far as their thoughts uh, in trauma. The one thing I just kind of talk about is just sort of the general kind of scheme in trauma. So I think these are the things I would think about. If you're going to give it, give it early. Um, I think most people in Central Ohio are going to see trauma pretty early in the game. And I think if you have a very, you know, very uh, injured patient, severely injured patient, that patient's going to benefit from this as well. Uh, for isolated tra traumatic brain injury, probably not yet. Um, I guess what I would say is treat it like the cherry on top. If you have a severely trauma, injured trauma patient and they're needing to be decompressed on their lungs and they need a tourniquet and they need to be intubated and they need two good large bore IVs and they need some fluid to restore their, their, their uh, blood pressure just to meet perfusion, you're doing all these things, you're wrapping binders, you're doing all these things we know help trauma patients. I would do that first and then think about TXA after that. TXA is sort of the trauma, on, is sort of the cherry on top on, on trauma. It's not something I'd be reaching for immediately from the medic bag. I'd be doing all the things you guys are fantastic and uh, about and really about the things that you really save lives with, those, those great medic skills that you guys have. And then when everything is wrapped up and you're going to the hospital, this is when you might consider giving TXA. The other part of it is it's no huge issue if you don't get TXA pre-hospital. Um, it's something that we sometimes evaluate, and I'll talk a little bit later actually at the end of the lecture how we sometimes decide to give TXA in some of our trauma centers. Um, but I would say um, definitely not going to do harm, would be beneficial in those that are really injured and those that um, have a uh, trauma that you see unfold in your face and really can give it pretty early. Again, cherry on the top uh, type approach. All right, so let's kind of move on to some other, um, I wouldn't say indications, but maybe some uh, off-label usages of TXA. So what about subarachnoid hemorrhage or intracerebral hemorrhage that is not related to trauma? So uh, there's two trials. There's ULTRA and there's, I think it's TIC2 or TICH2. I'm not sure. Um, and this uh, is for those that have head bleeds not related to trauma. So ULTRA looked at TXA versus usual care in atraumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, they did not see a mortality benefit or a functional score improvement in subarachnoid hemorrhage. At six months, they do a scoring system called the Modified Ranking Score, if anyone's interested in that. It's basically a functional independent score to see how, how much care you need, uh, whether you're independent, walking with a walker, need nursing care, if you're, you know, if you're in a sense in a nursing home or, or, or dead. And um, no benefit here with, uh, in the ultra trial for atraumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, and there's some subgroup analysis thinking, gosh, maybe could there certain subset of patients do well at six months, but really not great data on this. Uh, one thing you can take away though, like many of the other literature we've covered, there is no difference in your venous thromboembolism risk, your VTE risk, and no serious adverse, object, uh, uh, adverse events. That being said, I don't think we really have anything to go on here. I think for those that have head bleeds unrelated to trauma, I think this is a big red. Uh, TICH2 or TIC2, I'm not sure exactly how to say that, but uh, this uh, similar looked at uh, TXA versus placebo in atraumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage patients. Uh, excluded those that uh, had uh, bleeding secondary to anticoagulation. This is maybe 2,500 patients or so. Again, no difference in uh, functional independence, in, independence at 90 days. They, they looked at um, how big the, the bleeding got and, and could there be an improvement. There's a sort of a questionable benefit in how the expansion of the hematoma went and maybe some early death, but death by day 90, but three months, the same, uh, same number, no uh, statistical improvement. So maybe a little less red than ultra, but still, I, I don't think we have much role uh, for, uh, I'm gonna give this a red for subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, unrelated to trauma, intracerebral hemorrhage too. All right, so maybe we can talk about the others a little bit. So um, one thing you, uh, you might see in the emergency department, we love this. Um, it may not have the biggest benefit, or, but nosebleeds. So um, this is something um, that I would say is probably the most common reason you might even see TXA in the emergency department and a little bit of mixed bag. So the uh, first uh, trials hoping to cover is topical TXA compared with nasal packing for treatment of uh, epistaxis. And uh, this looked at uh, faster, and this was uh, faster bleeding cessation, less re-bleeding at one week, 
shorter ED length of stay and higher patient satisfaction compared to packing. And what they're basically doing is they're putting uh, this TXA in the nose with a little pledge of some cotton wool versus packing it with one of those rhino rockets, that kind of nasal tampon looking thing, which is very uncomfortable. If anyone's had that, it's, it's quite uncomfortable for the patients. Patients hate them. And um, unfortunately, they have to stay in typically for a few days and get removed either later in the ED or in the ENT's office. So this one actually kind of got a big green. And this was an early trial, very small uh, a trial. And uh, there was a new group that uh, kind of almost took this baton and, and took it a little bit further, the NOPAC trial. And again, this looked at TXA and cotton wool placed in for 10 minutes versus cotton wool soaked in, in water. And about 500 patients, no benefit in requiring uh, anterior pack, recurrent epistaxis, or admi administration of blood transfusion. Uh, for both of these, there was no real risk, no increased risk of thromboembolic uh, phenomenon, um, but maybe maybe not as much benefit as you might think. And I guess the take home here is it, it probably doesn't hurt. I think there might be a time eventually where you might see this on a truck. It's the same medication you'd give IV. You just soak it in a pledge it and put it in there. Uh, that being said, for the most part, from the pre-hospital um, uh, viewpoint, direct pressure is the first line regardless. And if you pinch their nose with one of those clamps or just have the patient um, pinch their nose, that's really the first line for any type of bleeding is direct pressure to achieve hemostasis. I, I'm not so sure this is something I'd be jumping right to. Um, just note that this might be something coming up in the future for refractory bleeding despite pressure. All right, so moving along. Um, next trial I was hoping to talk to you about is inhale TXA for hemoptysis treatment, RCT, randomized control trial. And this was a RCT of nebulized T TXA. So they took the same material that you give IV and they nebulized it versus placebo for non-massive hemoptysis. So less than 200 mLs coughing up blood in 24 hours, very small, about 47 patients. And uh, it actually did show improvement in hemoptysis within five days um, and increased resolution uh, via the TXA neb. Um, kind of a, a, an interesting study. Um, it improved their length of stay and actually improved those that would need an invasive procedure like a bronchoscopy, um, a scope to go in the lungs and try to stop the bleeding that way. Um, definitely kind of a, an interesting topic. I'd say this one might have some practicality. Um, I, I kind of think of using TXA uh, nebulized for those that may have lung cancer and have a little bit of bleeding but not massive and have this little scab or maybe a little blood vessel that popped in their lung. And, uh, and just need to kind of stop it with, uh, with nebulized TXA. I, I think this is something you might see in the future. Um, it's not something where you can use with massive uh, hemoptysis and they're um, aspirating and they need airway control. This is for, uh, for small volume hemoptysis and um, something just to kind of keep in the back of your brain. I'd give this kind of a light dream. All right, moving along. So halt it trial. Uh, this one was actually for gastrointestinal bleeding. This was a randomized control trial, TXA versus placebo in upper or lower GI bleeding. And, and this one actually, the, the caveat was the provider had to deem that patient to be unstable and risk of, of death related to bleeding from gastrointestinal bleeding. So pretty sick cohort, about 12,000 patients, uh, no benefit actually on the five-day mortality. Um, and uh, no uh, difference with free bleeding or needed for transfusion due to adult GI bleeding. Um, interestingly enough, they, they, there was sort of this thought that maybe an increased VTE risk, they, they thought 0.8 versus 0.4%, and maybe an increased risk of seizure. Not sure exactly how to make that kind of uh, correlate to the other uh, studies we've been talking about because there's really no increased risk VTE in pretty much anything else we've done. So sort of unusual, but that being said, if there's maybe a little sliver of harm in gastrointestinal bleeding and, and no benefit, then obviously this one gets the big red light. All right, so a few extra things. One of the uh, um, kind of popular uh, blogs um, uh, out there uh, talks about angioedema and TXA. And um, this is something I've personally not used. Um, I've, I've heard a few of my colleagues try it and sort of anecdotally it's, it's helped. Um, it's really nothing that is based on actual evidence right now, though. It's mostly anecdotal and case reports uh, showing benefit uh, for those that have, let's say, hereditary angioedema or idiopathic angioedema, ACE inhibitor-induced uh, angioedema. I've, I've um, heard uh, anecdotal evidence of giving one gram over 10 minutes with benefit. I will say this is somewhat of a yellow. I'd almost make it a little bit more red right now, to be honest with you, because I'd hate for this to get in the way of good airway management. I think airway management 
uh, precedes anything when it comes to angioedema and securing the airway sooner than later, I think would be my my kind of advice rather than to see if TXA is work and working if it's not really a proven uh, entity. That being said, um, you know, this, this is something that will likely need further uh, studies. Really hard to study something like angioedema because it's not very common and hard to randomize patients. Uh, but you might see this in the future. So I'll give this a yellow, probably a little bit more orange, to be honestly, but um, we'll keep it at yellow for now. All right, moving right along. So um, the next uh, kind of indication, I guess, the next reason you might see this being given uh, is uh, actually in postpartum hemorrhage. So you might hear about uh, the WOMAN trial. Um, so this is uh, a trial that uh, looked at postpartum hemorrhage, and uh, there was no all-cause mortality difference uh, or hysterectomy in postpartum hemorrhage, so all-cause mortality. But when they looked at just deaths from postpartum hemorrhage specifically, it might be a little bit lower. Now, uh, this study, they, they manipulated a lot of their data points. Their uh, primary and secondary endpoints are changed. And boy, th this, this is not the best way you want to go about research. And I, I can't make a solid conclusion based on that. That being said, the, um, and uh, there'll be a professional um, uh, coming up, a, a few presenters after me that can maybe talk a little bit more in depth about it. But uh, it seems to be in the ACOG guidelines as a consideration for postpartum hemorrhage. Um, for those that um, might be uh, significantly bleeding uh, from postpartum hemorrhage. Um, I guess my take would be this would be pretty hard to interface in the pre-hospital realm. It'd be a pretty unusual situation to see. This is something typically seen in the OB suite. And I, I would say probably not something I would be thinking about uh, if you have a patient that's been delivering. I think this is one of those where um, it's going to be an in-hospital in type of indication. All right, so TXA, I guess the big picture. So how do we wrap this all up? So TXA, you know, again, for me, this is a, an agent that prevents clots from being broken down. I think that's pretty clear from the evidence that this really is not gonna increase, at least in clinical base data, increase your chance of clotting in your legs or your lungs. I, I just don't see that there's much chance of harm here. Um, that being said, it seems to be marginal benefit in most things. Um, trauma, perhaps the, the benefit, uh, you know, having the most benefit. I would say if you're going to give it, give it early. Again, that cherry on the top type of um, uh, kind of indication. You're doing all the things that we know save lives, and TXA on top of that is sort of the cherry on top. I think if you're going to give it, give it to those that are really bleeding, you know, those that have significant hemorrhage, particularly in trauma. Um, this isn't something you, you give for, you know, patient that got in a little car wreck, has a little belly pain, their heart rate's 112. You know, that's not really the indication. The indication is for severe shocky patients, patients that have blood pressures less than 90, and honestly, probably less than 75. Heart rate above 110 is, for me, even if probably a little soft. And those that really have significant trauma, both blunt and probably penetrating, but I think mostly in, in central Ohio, I think we're going to use this for blunt trauma pre-hospital, and again, giving it very early. Um, some contraindications, I would say, um, you know, definitely those that have a uh, history of clots in the past, like pulmonary embolism and DVT, probably not going to give it to those patients. Um, not going to give it to pregnant patients. Um, pediatrics on, is, is not quite there yet. I, I'm not sure I'd be giving it to anyone uh, that's pediatric right now. Um, <clears throat> and those that have what's called DIC, which is like an imbalance of their clotting cascade as well. That's not something, unfortunately, you're going to know about. So um, overall, and, and hypersensitive, if patients have allergies, again, you're not going to know about that. Overall, check with your medical director uh, and talk it over with them uh, and see, particularly with trauma, this might be some uh, some of benefit. Uh, one last thing I was hoping to, uh, to cover, and I'll, I'll wrap up and leave some time here uh, for questions in the end, is what's called thromboelastography or a thromboelastogram. So this is something you might hear about, um, not, not unfortunately something quite ready that we can put on a truck, but it's basically a, a technology that we use at, at uh, various uh, sites that looks at kind of a real life or real time uh, coagulation profile, what's happening with the patient in their clotting scheme and how do we use that to determine resuscitation. So it's, it, actually it actually measures the physical properties of a clot it uh, has this little pin that vibrates in, in, in the patient's blood and it actually transmits that information into this little pin uh, that goes into a transducer and gives you this graph. 
Um, and looking at the graph, there's sort of this almost like a wine glass shape. And, and honestly, wine glass, that wine glass can be different types of uh, morphologies. And looking at the, uh, that graph, the computer can um, actually calculate some components to know what's actually going on and why they may need certain factors and, way, and uh, products that, um, that might benefit them for, uh, uh, in the hospital. So the first part, that green part, the R time, that's basically the time to start forming a clot. Uh, if people have a delayed R time, that's usually a problem with coagulation factors. Um, and if, uh, if they have an issue in the green, we, we tend to give them plasma. The K time is the time until the clot reaches a fixed strength. And um, again, if that, uh, if that K time is abnormal, uh, sometimes they have problems with fibrinogen, we give them a product uh, uh, cryoprecipitate. Uh, alpha angle, very similar. Um, it lets us know um, if they have problems with uh, fibrin accumulation. And uh, again, they would get cryoprecipitate. That MA, that kind of uh, amplitude, I guess, is the, kind of the thickness, I guess, of the wine glass. The highest vertical amplitude of the tag, that gives us an indication if they have problems with their platelets. And sometimes they'll get platelets or a medication called DDAVP, kind of a, a way to make their platelets more sticky, I guess, is a way to think of that. And then the last one, that uh, lysis at 30 minutes, that's sort of the, your how much um, clot breakdown there is, I guess is sort of a way to think of it. Is the clot being broken down too quickly? Is there excessive fibrinolysis? And that's um, something where you might give TXA. So um, that gives us kind of a real-time cheat sheet. Um, this process can take maybe 15 or more minutes. So that's one problem in trauma. You don't necessarily have 15 minutes to um, uh, kind of go over this graph if you have a very severely injured patient. And if they're getting massive transfusion in the hospital, oftentimes we'll give TXA with it um, as a um, as sort of a, an empiric treatment. Uh, that being said, if it's someone that's sort of moderately injured and we have time, then many times we'll do this tag or thrombo uh, thromboelastogram to give us sort of a real-time um, uh, evaluation of their cascade. So yeah, I guess the, um, uh, the kind of pulling it all together, I think we're getting back to the case and hopefully you can kind of verbalize this out loud. So just to kind of recap, there's a 23-year-old male. He crashes his motorcycle at 120 miles per hour. He's unhelmeted. He's thrown 100 feet from the motorcycle. His blood pressure is 60 over palp. Heart rate's in the 130s. He appears to have an unstable pelvis. He has no breath sounds on the left. He has severe facial injuries with active bleeding into his oropharynx. He's uh, got a GCS of five. His left leg was snapped in half. He's got pulsatile bleeding from an open fracture. So I guess maybe think about this for a minute, like how would TXA be involved in this care? And kind of, uh, you know, putting it all together. This is one of those where, you know, you're not gonna go straight to TXA, obviously. You're gonna put a tourniquet in that, in that leg to, um, to stop uh, external hemorrhage of an arterial bleed. You're gonna secure their airway, their ABCs. You're gonna make sure they're not bleeding the oropharynx and, and losing their airway. You're going to get resuscitation going with two large bore IVs. You're going to decompress that pneumothorax because they're hypotensive and showing signs of shock and may have tension pneumothorax. You might feel their pelvis and feel it to be unstable, and you're going to wrap it with a binder. Give them some fluid, probably not tons of fluid, but enough to restore perfusion. And then once everything is set and you're, th and you're thinking, boy, okay, I think we're good here. Their, their systolic blood pressure is up to 90. Their heart rate's into the one, maybe one teens. Their pelvis is bound, they have good access, their, their endotricular tube is, is secure, we've got uh, good breath sounds after decompressing them. What about TXA? Boy, this is probably that person. This is the one I'd probably give it for, that person that's severely injured right after uh, the incident within the one hour for someone that has severe shock, an adult patient, not pregnant, he's male, and uh, obviously no, no known contraindications such as thromboembolic events, but something you're obviously not going to know. So that's kind of the, the cherry on the top, I'd say. That's the, that's the time where coming into the hospital and you're, um, you're giving a report, that might be the time to give TXA. Um, that being said, if it's not given in that trauma patient, don't feel bad about it. It's something that we can always give in the hospital. Just something to, um, uh, to give kind of a little bit more um, uh, credence as far as um, kind of like, as I said, your, your cherry on the top. So I'm trying to unshare my presentation. I guess I'll, I'll hand it back off to the, the powers that be. Um, I wanted to leave a few minutes here for questions. I can't remember if I left maybe a few more minutes than I'm supposed to, but 
Any questions from the crowd? Any questions from the panelists? Danny, that, that was fantastic. We do have a, a question from one of the um, crowd, which is that their TXA protocol is basically for um, blunt trauma uh, or internal hemorrhage uh, is the way they say it. And, and do you think TXA would be a benefit for traumatic amputation? Um, I have an opinion on this that I will share, but I want to hear yours first. Yeah, um, I, I don't think there's robust data to say it right now, to be honest with you. I think the data uh, is mostly on um, uh, is mostly on blunt trauma and penetrating trauma. And now I'll say if you have if you have, if you've lost your leg, if you amputated your leg and you've got a tourniquet on, you've kind of controlled the bleeding. So again, TXA is not a procoagulant. It's an agent to stop your clot from being broken down. So your leg's gone, the vessel's gone. So there's nothing to really help hemostasis. If you have achieved hemostasis with a tourniquet, then I don't think really there's much role for TXA. Um, now, if you're having significant trouble and you're using you know, five different tourniquets and, and, and someone's like, hey, do you wanna give some TXA? I don't think there's much harm, but really the, the, the goal in um, extremity loss, the traumatic amputation is tourniquets. It's, it's, it's actually, it's external hemorrhage control. Drew, what do you think? Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. And, and the other thing I would add to it is I don't want to detract from what is most important, which is direct pressure and tourniquet hemorrhage control in that situation. So, um, you know, if, if you only have so many hands available, the thing I want you reaching for is direct pressure and the tourniquet. And then, you know, later down the road, um, if, if we have hemorrhage control and there's concern for internal bleeding, then giving TXA probably is reasonable. Um, you know, I think you summarized it in your talk uh, pretty well, which is uh, for trauma situations. Um, is there a lot of benefit? I don't know, but there's really not any harm. Um, and of all the things that we do medication wise, it's not an expensive medication, uh, certainly compared to a lot of other things. So, um, yes, but uh, for amputation and active external bleeding, pressure, 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 whether that's through tourniquet or direct pressure um, and all the other things that we know how to do. Is, is by far more important. And I, I think I see a question. I agree with that, Drew. I, I think I see a question. So we really don't need to run out and get it for our protocols. I think I see that. Yeah, to be honest with you, here's my take on TXA. Um, you know, we always love the new exciting things. And um, I think that just kind of, uh, I think that's fun and, and it's exciting. And, uh, but TXA is, is really, it really is the cherry on the top. I, I, I think at times there's this kind of thought and maybe tendency to that TXA is going to save the day. And the, weird, the other thing I did not mention is TXA's onset is not necessarily immediate. It takes hours for, for TXA sometimes to work. Really, what we appreciate the most from our EMS providers is good, just general trauma care. It really is getting good access, decompressing lungs, getting good airway, getting external hemorrhage control, those things really save lives. TXA is a sliver of a benefit. And to be honest, in central Ohio, it depends a little bit on your department. If you're out a little bit further from, let's say central Ohio, or maybe um, in some of the surrounding counties, um, and you might be, boy, two or three hours from a trauma center, they probably are gonna have a little bit more benefit. Um, those patients that you get, that you guys see on the scene, they have to go maybe uh, to a, a landing zone. The helicopter has to pick them up and, and get them to a trauma center. And it might be an hour or two, depending uh, of how long your dispatch time is. Those patients may be a little benefit. Um, if you're pretty close to central Ohio and pretty close to a trauma center, there's, there's probably not a ton of benefit. Um, so I would say it this way, this is not something I would rush out to get into your protocol. It's something I would do literature review with your medical director and as a team and see if it fits with you. If you don't have a whole lot of personnel to help, this might kind of get in the way. And I, I'd hate for that to get in the way of good trauma resuscitation and good trauma EMS care when it really is sort of just the cherry on top. So Danny, to put you on the spot a little bit, what does your protocol say for your department? Are you using we it? We have it. We have it. So uh, my guys are itching for it, gals, guys and gals. And uh, to be honest, I was a little uh, hesitant to put it in. It took me maybe a year or two to get it into my protocol. Um, one thing we, we train about when we talk about TXA in our in departments is please do not let this be even in the first three lines of resuscitation. I mean, 
really because as you said drew you you just don't want this to distract you from good resuscitation care you'd hate to miss a pneumothorax and have a hypotensive tension pneumothorax that could have been a, could have been managed without you know what you know pre-hospital could have been managed with uh, decompression of the lung when you're trying to mix up TXA and there's a lot of pressure when you haven't used it much. Um, it's been used a few times in our, in our protocol um, and it's there. Um, the way our protocol reads is really for that severely, severely injured patient. Um, once you've done your resuscitation, um, we, we do our 16 and above non-pregnant patients and obviously no contraindications to TXA. Um, that's sort of the consideration. Um, the way our protocol reads is is kind of do all the all the the critical care stuff first, the fun stuff, and once you've stabilized the patient, then you can um, you can kind of go to the next step. So I, I do have it in my protocol. I was a little hesitant at first. Um, I think this is something though that um, I think once you um, kind of get the patient packaged up and you have time, I think it's something to consider. Yeah, and I think that's a great approach. You know, I I don't have it in my default protocol that it, that I kind of have prepackaged. Um, that I like, but if a department wants it, I don't have a good objection to not using it. And, and as long as you, they approach it the way you just explained, I think it's a really reasonable uh, thing to have, um, particularly if there's some uh, long transport and for our not quite as urban departments. But uh, I'd be curious, any of the other panelists have a strong opinion about TXA before we uh, take a quick break and transition on to the next speaker or any other questions from um, the, the crowd? All right, well, just so that we're not uh, leaving too much silence there. Danny, thank you. Awesome presentation, a really great review of the various potential uses and the data that supports or doesn't support TXA. Um, I, I think we're, we're in agreement, at least uh, between you and myself and the few other uh, docs I know on the call um, about how to approach it and, and how to do it. So thank you so much for, for lending us your expertise today. Well, uh, I'll say this too. Um, uh, definitely, definitely, there are experts out there that are happy to talk to you as well. I'm sure there's some trauma surgeons in, in Central Ohio that would love to give you their take. I just want to reiterate, I just uh, really appreciate everyone that's taking their time to listen in here. And uh, I, I've, uh, I've interfaced with almost, I feel like, any department in Central Ohio. And I, I can brag against you guys, against anybody else in the country. You guys have been fantastic. Um, we really appreciate your care. Stay safe out there. And uh, Next time, hopefully get to see you guys in person. We are uh, running just a few minutes ahead of schedule, which is totally fine. Why don't we take a, uh, a quick minute to, to stretch our legs? We're gonna transition over to Dr. Van Muldern, who's gonna be talking to us about unusual medical emergencies. So while he's getting his presentation pulled up and whatnot, we will uh, just take a, a quick minute or two and, and go from there. But uh, Danny, again, thank you so much. Thank you.